This podcast does not provide medical advice. Please listen to the complete disclosure at the end of the recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Everyone Dies, the podcast. I'm Marianne Matzo. And I'm looking for my lost shaker of salt. Still? Yeah. So who the heck are you? Um, Charlie Navarrete. Very good. Thank you. This is a great time to take a little break, find something sweet or salty, whichever makes you happiest, something to drink, no judgments here, and join us as we offer another edition of Death by Chocolate. In the second half, I'm going to talk with you about strokes, and we have a great interview with a woman by the name of Jan Douglas, who's the author of A Wonderful Stroke of Luck. And in our third half, we're going to do a scene from My Beautiful Broken Brain. You know, Charlie, I found this book. It's Mm -hmm. called um, Being Dead is No Excuse, the official Southern Lady's Guide to Hosting the Perfect Funeral. Yeah. (laughs) What do you you think of that? Uh, That's easy for you to say. Um, You know what? It's good because, you know, there's there's a movement now about, you know, being death positive. Where people plan their funeral, yeah. plan music, you know, in addition to advanced care directives. But, you know, do you want to go out in style? Go out in style. Yeah, yeah I think it's great. Well, this book, and, yeah. and we'll put it in our re- in our references on our website, this book will help you learn how to do it. So I started to read because, you know, I got to get things perfect. Mm-hmm. And... um what, and their whole thing is to advise you about planning tasteful funerals. I don't know if I care if mine's tasteful, but whatever. Well, if there's chocolate. So I got to page. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know. Mm-hmm. There's, yeah. Right? right. Um. So I got to page 193 where they talk about chocolate chess pie. Mm. And I thought, this is really interesting. So, um, Charlie, what do you know about this cake? And what do you know about how it got its name? Well, uh, there are different stories, and one is that it's got its name because it was made with chestnut flour. And in the early 1900s, there was a blight, and that pretty much uh, destroyed uh, chestnut flowers. Wait a minute. What? How do you get flour from a tree? (laughs) (laughs) Something just came to mind. (laughs) It happened in a. It happened in a. Having a couple of cocktails with friends, and I can't say that on the air. Uh, so well, you so you 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 take a nut. I mean, think of the peanut. Um, oh, it's what, from the so, the nut, the yes. chestnut nut of the tree. I was thinking they like lob off a limb and grind. It. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is your beverage for the evening? So. Um, uh, Oh no 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 no! It's it's, it. it's, the, it's the it's the actual chestnut, not not the whole tree. Oh, uh, no. you're so smart. Huh? Okay, yeah. So I'm with you. All right, very good. Well, so so that's one one thing, uh, and there was a blight on, on chestnuts, and that pretty much eliminated chestnut flour. Another story is that in the 19th century, Alabama. Um, you know, in nineteenth century, you know, in Alabama in the nineteenth century, there was a free slave, um, and she made a living selling pies to her neighbors. So, during a time when pecans and other nuts were hard to come by, she made a sugar pie, uh, combining eggs, sugar, flour, flour or cornmeal, uh, butter, and spices, spices or citrus, uh, you know, to cut the sweetness. Well, somebody asked her what kind of pie she had made. And the woman replied, oh, it's just pie. And so supposedly the name chess pie was coined. Oh, isn't that clever? Yeah. Oh, it's just pie. It was, just you know, it's pie. the same thing like it's the same thing like Manhattan. Manhattan, we call it Manhattan, but the native Indians in Manhattan were the Matawanas. The Dutch couldn't pronounce that properly, and Matawana became Manhattan. Okay, yes. Oh, it's it's just like it, Charlie. I I mm-hmm. was thinking, gosh, this is the same thing. It's like Manhattan. Chess pa. Chess pa. Yes. Chess pa. So, let's go back. Speaking of the Dutch, let's rewind to England. Hundreds <laughs> of years or how do you like that segue? Thank you. 
Re so rewind to England, hundreds of years earlier, when cooks and housemaids combined ingredients prone to spoilage with sugar, a thing that helps suffocate those thirsty microbes that make milk and unsalted butter go bad. The heavy custard consisted of the usual suspects, eggs, butter, cream, so much sugar, flour, that uh, whatever spices you could find. So the pie could be kept unrefrigerated in a chest for however long it lasted. And the longer like it sat there... Like my jewelry there, chest or my sweater chest? Um, yeah, or a chest of drawers. Yeah. Or, or, or Chester from Gunsmoke. Can you imagine a chest of drawers just full of pie? Just pie. Did you say full of pot? Pie. Oh, pie. Damn pie. Um, actually, I could. Yes. Mm. So, where was I? Oh, yes, chests. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, pie could be, you know, with all the, all the ingredients I mentioned, I mean, pie could be kept unrefrigerated in a chest, you know, for however long it lasted. And the longer it sat there, the better the flavor was. And so supposedly the name chest pie was coned. In other words, nobody really knows and they made up stories. Thank you. I was trying to find the right word. Thanks. So check out the recipe from Stacy Little at Southern Bite for Chocolate Chest Pie posted on our webpage. Additionally, please go to everyonedies.org. That's every, the number one, dies.org to find resources and more recipes from this podcast. If you can lend financial support to this nonprofit organization, please go to everyonedies.org slash donate to make your tax-deductible donation. Also, we appreciate your questions and anything else you want to tell us by emailing mail at everyonedies.org. While you're at it, join our Facebook group, Everyone Dies. This time you have to spell out everyone. So our Facebook group, Everyone Dies. And please remember to rate and review this podcast. Molly, who shot the sheriff but did not shoot the deputy, is our Twitter correspondent and is hoping you will follow us on Twitter and repost her tweets so that we stop making up names for her. But how can we stop? Well, thank you for that, Charles. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, in the second half, we're going to chat about strokes and in particular, right-sided strokes. So first I'll tell you a little bit about what strokes are and then um, some of the differences. So do you well, remember that film, Dave, where the president oh, has Kevin a Klein stroke? is, uh, yeah, Kevin, yeah. Yeah. Frank Langella. So the, no. Oh, yeah. So the president has a stroke and instead of them telling the American people that he had a stroke... And then he wasn't able to rule the country. They put in Kevin Klein as a um, as a dead substitute. ringer for the uh, yeah. No pun intended. Yeah. And so what they told the public is that Mitchell, who's the president, has had a minor circular circulatory problem of the head. <laughs> and um, if only Charlie. A stroke was a minor circulatory problem of the head. But unfortunately, that mm -hmm. is not the definition of a stroke. A stroke is an injury or attack to the brain caused by a change in the blood supply to the brain. So every part of our bodies has to have blood in order to stay alive. And the blood, the reason they need it, we need the blood is that because in the blood, in the, in the red blood cells, it's, you know, carrying around oxygen everywhere it goes. And it's that oxygen that keeps us alive. So brain cells must have a constant supply of oxygen, which is delivered by the blood. If the blood vessel becomes clogged or if it bursts, brain cells supplied by that vessel will not receive the proper amount of oxygen needed and it'll either become very damaged or else it, it will die. So unless there's oxygen getting to all the pieces, parts of our body, those parts can die, can close off and die. So when a stroke occurs in the brain, um, the body function controlled by the damaged cells are also affected. So depending on where in your head that stroke occurs depends yeah. on whatever part 
that that part of the brain controls. Yes, Charles. So um, Char- Charlie just raised his hand. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> can, I, can I get a refill? No. So um, <laughs> it wasn't for you. It was, it was for the waiter. Okay. So so I hear what you're saying about you know depends on what side of the brain, but you specifically said the right side. So it, is is there so a difference it, from the so left side it, or? Yes, because one's on the left and one's on the right. Next. <laughs> Thank you very much. But, <laughs> hang on, let, let me write this down. So, so uh-huh. you know, you have two sides of your brain, yeah. and you also have a front and a back. But think of it as left and right. The left side of your brain controls the right side of your body, and the oh. right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. So depending on where the stroke is depends on which side of the body um, has a problem. But beyond that, which I'm going to talk about, um, there are certain structures on the left and the right side of the brain that control other things like reading and talking uh-huh. and things like that. So it depends on a variety of things, how big it is, how, you know, and, how important the, the part of the brain that's affected. But yeah. Wait a minute. Did, did you say that, that it also depends? Okay. So earlier you said something about, um, uh, what part of the body is affected? You mean if if there's something wrong, let's say, for example, okay, so your heart is on the left side of your body. So if you have a problem with your heart, then you are more prone to a what uh, stroke on the right side of your brain? Is is that it? Or? No, because the thing with the thing with heart and the thing with lungs yeah. is that they're kind of hardwired. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, you would have to blow out, let's say, the brain stem in order to affect how the heart and lung are going to work. Because there are certain things that your body must have in order to work. It has to have a brain, um, it has to have lung power, and it has to have heart power. Okay. And so in the design of the body, some things are um, hardwired and other things, you know, so heart beat heart beating lungs breathing um and blood getting up into the brain those are vital or else we don't support life but things like do we need to talk in order to live um frankly no and so if you have a stroke in that area mm-hmm. it can be really frustrating because you can't talk but you can certainly but you live. live right so um what's usually pretty what's Pretty unusual, though, is that when somebody is having a stroke, their ability to then later tell you this happened and then this happened and this happened is very unusual. And uh, there's a woman named Janet Douglas, and she wrote a book called A Wonderful Stroke of Luck. It was put out in 2018 by Archway Publications. And I had the privilege of interviewing her. She talked about her stroke, and she does a wonderful job explaining what she was going through. And for me as a nurse practitioner, it was absolutely fascinating because of all my years of taking care of patients. I've never had anybody say, let me tell you about the the details of my stroke while it occurred. It is oh. really interesting. So... So sit back, Charlie, you know, refresh that drink real quick. And um, Janet's talking with me about actually having the stroke. Today I have the pleasure of talking with um, Jan Douglas. Janet Douglas, uh, she is a woman who uh, was an occupational therapist, uh, lived and traveled and done all kinds of wonderful things, and uh, was went to a wedding in England and had a stroke and had a major stroke. And when they took her into the hospital for surgery there, they um, told her family that she had about a 10% chance of surviving the surgery. And fortunately, she did survive. And, uh, and, and trust me, I hope you get her book called A Wonderful Stroke of Luck so that you can, um, can hear about her story. So, Janet Douglas, welcome to Everyone Dies. Thank you for joining us. 
Thank you for inviting me. So we had talked, we always talk a little bit, I talked with my guests a little bit before, like, what would you want to talk about? And and Mrs. Douglas was saying that she really kind of wanted to talk about um, survival and that she was a little bit curious about why we were called Everyone Dies, even though it's true. It's one of those things that kind of smacks you in the face, doesn't it, Mrs. Douglas? Yes, it does. What did you think when you first saw that name? Well, I was a little mystified by it, and I thought, well, yes, everyone does die. And I'm also going to say that there are different definitions of dying because people can die without having their heart actually stop or their brain stop functioning. In other words, they can be so distraught over a health issue or a family issue that they essentially stop living, and um, that was a situation that I found confronted me in the early days post-stroke was I was so heavily disabled at that time and totally without identity or memory, and essentially my life had ended. It had ended as I knew it, but over time... And this is the, the I hope, upbeat part of my book and my story is that I began to realize that the life that I had before had died, but there was a whole new life that was waiting for me that I just had to figure out how to grasp it and move forward. Did you find that it was a difficult decision for you to in a sense, let go of what was and grasp what the new, that new life was? It, it was extremely difficult, and it took a long time. And I think most people are familiar with the stages of grieving that are usually mm-hmm. associated with death and dying. Mm-hmm. And, but I associate it more broadly with loss. And I went through all those stages of denial and anger and bargaining and through the whole thing until finally the last stage, the hardest one of all, was acceptance that who I was now was not who I was before, but that the new person had an awful lot going for her. What did it take for you to find that acceptance? Do you remember the feeling or the process? Um, It took a lot of time, and it took a lot of support, I would say, from family and friends. Um, And I have to say realistically that while I think... All of my family stuck with me. That certainly was not true of friends. Really? And part of the process, yes, part of the process that I had to work through and that was hard was figuring out that who my friends really were and who were friends and who were habits. And I meant by that, who were the people who hung around when I was very successful and had a lot to give first and then disappeared immediately when that was no longer the case, when I no longer had a, an important, powerful position that could benefit them. This may sound very cynical, but I'm trying to be honest that mm-hmm. the people who were in it for me, as the po- in the relationship for me, as opposed to for themselves, and that was tough and painful, but again, at the end of that long process, I emerged with, uh, you know, the, the nucleus of old friends who were real friends and some new ones, mm. and so, and the ones who fell away were the habits who were not friends at all, humbling and um, just overwhelming in their kindness and generosity. Mm-hmm. And acceptance. Mm-hmm. What do you think, you know, and it, it's been a while, it was 2002 that this happened. Yes. Is that correct? And yes. And so it's, it's what, 
uh, 18 years ago. Yes. Which is kind of mind blowing that we're talking. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that uh, such a major stroke in that you're, you're, you've written a book and then you were telling me yesterday that you're the director of human resources and that you're, you know, that you're a very active woman. So with the perspective of 18 years and looking back on that, do you have a sense or a thought about what it is you've learned? Because I'm sure like a year after afterwards, what you learned is probably different than what you would say you've learned today. Well, it took a while because I mentioned of the anosognosia. I had some other um, brain issues too that I couldn't really read. I mean, if if when they put a, put something in front of me and asked me to read it out loud, I could, but I couldn't extract the meaning from the words. So, in other words, um. I could read the cat sat on the mat and have no idea what it meant. And that was something that took a while. But I had been so active before the stroke, and I had a fairly high-powered job with a Fortune 500 company. And I got it into my head after about six months that the best thing for me to do would be to go back to work. And I was in no way capable, but I didn't know that. So I did go back to work. The company was very understanding and of course I couldn't drive but I got driven to and from work a couple or three times a week and that worked to a certain extent in that it put me in a framework that I was familiar with Mm -hmm. and I found found myself able to function pretty well within that environment and again I could as I said I couldn't read at that point I didn't know I couldn't read Properly, I didn't understand that the word Alexia, which, you know, I learned as I did my own research later on, was not like aphasia when you lose the ability to speak, but it means the inability to extract meaning from words. Mm -hmm. So I could fake it amazingly well, and someone would hand me something to sign and say, read this, and I'd say, quickly, just tell me what it says, because I have a lot to do. So they would tell me what it said, and then I would sign it. And um, when I did start to read again, it was with my ears. In other words, I found that I could, I absolutely loved to read. It was one of my favorite, um, I would say hobby, but um, yeah, I guess a hobby thing that I did when I wasn't working or being with my family was to read. I traveled a lot for work, so I'd read on airplanes. But since I couldn't do that, I started to listen to books on tape. Mm-hmm. And I found that was a great substitute. And um, you know, gradually over time, I found alternatives to do things around the house or to do my job or to function pretty well. And as I, the more I did, the more I felt like I was getting back to who I was before. But it took a long time. It took probably three or four years wow. until I really um, got back the memories and the understanding of my own identity, even though it was different from the way it was before. But the you know and it's it's 18 years but i'd say it took me well it took me 5 years to be in a position people kept saying you should write a book because you used to be an occupational therapist and you know it would be very interesting for people to know your perspective but the people who were saying that had no idea how far i still had to go to be able to even think about sitting down and being able to write or type, you know, I now had the use of only one hand and one of my eyes was affected so that lines, as I mentioned about the scrambled eggs, the lines weren't going in the same direction. So I would be off a little bit with, in terms of trying to read. And I, to this day, cannot read a spreadsheet because 
there's a bobble in the line that will put me completely off. Oh, my. I'm kind of rambling, so I hope I'm answering your question. Well, I guess what I wanted to know is that right now at your, um, I don't know how old you are, but at this, this age self, looking, looking back over the last 18 years, what do you say to yourself? Do you say, you know, like, hot damn, I'm, I'm an incredible woman, which clearly you no, are. No, I say, <laughs> I say, thank God I'm alive because I have four grandsons that I would never have known. They're the light of my life. I've just passed 45 years of being married to the same man. I was at both of my daughter's weddings. And, you know, and I was able to recreate myself professionally. And I worked for a, I worked before, as I mentioned, for a Fortune 500 company. And uh, it was all about, you know, being busy and traveling and making lots of money for the company and being very well paid myself. The new me works for a nonprofit that resettles refugees. It's just in one location. It's about a 40-minute drive from my home, and it's a whole different experience, but I love it. And so all of these things that have come about in that 18 years, um, you know, we started off talking about dying and the different ways of dying. That, and I'm just going to flip back to that, too. Mm-hmm. So I've come to know a lot of stroke survivors through um, my experience and through writing the book and through some family experiences and through being a therapist who essentially died when they had the stroke, even though their hearts didn't stop but their life did, and they lost the ability to be able to kind of get up and go and move on with a new life. And I, I feel so incredibly blessed that that didn't happen to me, and I was able to put my energy and um, effort into a new life, a different mm-hmm. kind of life. You know, I can't dance anymore, but I can get around. (laughs) Um, And I can, you know, I can't ride a horse anymore, but I can still pat one on the nose. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, so many things that I can still do that make dying a horrible alternative. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so pleased that you took time to to talk with me and I'm so pleased you wrote this book and that Tom sent it to me and I'm going to finish reading it because it's just absolutely fascinating it's like being able to get inside to a place that generally you're not allowed into you know and and your your storytelling, if you will, expressing what went on is just exquisite. So I'm so pleased, um, at least, you know, for myself that you survived, and I'm pleased for your family and your, you that you survived to be able to um, have those experiences and to share with us this, this, this experience that, you know, without you, we, we just really would not have. And um, I hope that we get a chance at another time to talk about another aspect of your book and your life. I feel very blessed to have met you today, Ms. Douglas. Thank you, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. A stroke usually affects one side of the brain. The right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. So when a person has a right brain stroke, you can see problems with movement and sensation, you know, how the body moves, how the body feels on the left-hand side. But as I was saying, there's other things that go on within our brain, other structures that the brain controls. So if you have a stroke on one side or the other, there's going to be some differences. To say, oh, I had a stroke, tells you 
kind of like what happened. But it, unless you know, is it on the left side or the right side, you wouldn't know what other problems might go with that. Mm. And so today, because Janet's um, stroke was on the right side, yeah. today I'm going to talk about right-sided strokes. And we'll do a show later about left-sided strokes because they're different animals. So the right side of the brain controls language, and it helps us to make decisions, make judgments, make plans, show emotions, visually be aware of and understand the world around us, solve problems, and remember. So recovery from a stroke can really be pretty frustrating because it can take a long time. It can make, um, you might see some people will have some improvement within like about the first six months, but recovery can continue on for years and depending on how much um, physical therapy and therapeutic activities will really depend on how much uh, people are able to do. So when I'm talking about the changes that come with the right side stroke today, I'm going to also give the people who are listening, caregivers or people with strokes themselves, some ideas of ways that they can make some of the rehab a little bit easier. So after a right-sided stroke, you can see paralysis, um, hemiplegia, or weakness, which is hemiparesis. So paralysis is called hemiplegia. Hemi is one side or the other. Mm -hmm. And weakness, which is called hemiparesis. Um, so when you have a right-sided stroke, you're going to see those on the left side of the body. Due to this weakness or paralysis, you might need to use a cane to get around the house or a wheelchair when, they, when you go out. So some tips for walking with a cane or walker. Move the cane or walker forward first. Follow with your left foot, which is your bad foot, because we've had we're talking about a right side stroke. Yeah. So you have the walker cane in front of you. You're standing on your good foot. Your left foot has moved forward first. It's not really bearing weight. And then bring the right foot forward. So it's cane, affected foot, good foot. So that you can kind of keep a tripod that keeps you, helps prevent you from following. Um, range of motion is important to keep your body joints moving. Um, gentle motions, do exercises about twice a day. Um, if you start a movement, finish a movement. And if you have a broken leg or a fracture or anything like that, um, be sure you work with your physical therapy about um, your, your visual fields. I mean, about, uh, Sandy, let me back that up. Um, be sure you work with your physical therapist in terms of what range of motion activities you're going to do. Now, there's something else that happens if you've had your stroke on your right, Charlie, and it's called there's a visual field cut mm -hmm. or... Heminoposia. What's that? So this, this it's a visual field cut. It refers to partial blindness oh. on the same side of each eye. So, um, you know, like you have things that you see on the inner part with the inner parts of your eye, or you have things that you see on the outer parts of your eye. Now, this poses a danger for tripping and falling over things um, because you can't really see them. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where, you know, you've had surgery or something and you've like walked into a wall and you said, Nick, who put that wall there? Or, you know, maybe after drinking, I don't know. No, I never, never. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but it's not that somebody just put up a wall and, you know, oh, all of a sudden there it is and you walked into it. But it's more that your visual field didn't, didn't recognize it. So somebody who's had a right-sided stroke needs to constantly be turning their head. You know, like you and I, we can walk and our eyes will scan the area and kind of see a full range of motion, a full range of eye uh -huh. um, movement. But somebody who's had a right-sided stroke might only see the center part of their vision or they might only see the outer part of their vision. 
and can run into walls or run over everything, can really hurt themselves. So the way you deal with that is you have them to kind of look both ways. Remember when we were kids and they taught us those songs, look both ways Mm -hmm. as they're walking, constantly like forcing themselves to move their heads. That's not natural. That's not what we normally do. But after a stroke, it's something that would be necessary. Now, the visual field cut can also cause your loved one to become lost easily, even in familiar places. So for this reason, people who've had a right-sided stroke can have difficulty going out alone or driving. Really be sure to talk with your doctor, your healthcare practitioner about should the person be driving? Should they be able to go out alone? Because it's really frightening to get lost and it's really dangerous if you're not seeing certain parts of your visual field. So um, bathroom visits, this is a a part of right-sided strokes. Um, Because of the stroke, you might not know that you need to go to the bathroom. You might not have control over your bowel and bladder functions. Or your brain might be saying, uh, you need to start going to the bathroom, but because of the stroke, because of the damage in your brain, you're not getting the signal to say, go on and go. So rather than waiting to hear that signal, you really need to have a bathroom schedule. Maybe it's every 45 minutes, go in to go to use the bathroom if you need to or not, Um have a signal, like if you're, if you're in a couple relationship, have a signal to say, it's 45 minutes, let's go. Um, if you're going out somewhere, take a change of clothing um, in case an accident happens. And if an accident does occur, don't overact. Try not to scold the, the you know, your loved one. They didn't urinate on themselves or whatever on purpose they just missed the cue or didn't get the cue or whatever now with right side strokes charlie there are certain behavioral responses too it's a stroke is not all physical response there's things like uh, something called emotional lability. When somebody's labile, it means they mm-hmm. move back and forth really easily. So emotional lability is the inability to control feelings such as sadness or happiness. In the stroke survivor, feelings are often shown in an extreme way. For example, expressions and moods may change really suddenly. And these emotional outbursts, they can decrease with time, but often do not completely go away. So some suggestions for that. Keep a matter-of-fact attitude. When they're, you know, going off because the butter is left sitting on the counter, you can just kind of hear it out. You know, as human beings, we want to say, get your act together. It's just the butter. Chill out. Mm -hmm. And if they had been able to chill out, they would have chilled out in the first place. So just if, as long as nobody's getting hurt, just kind of have matter of fact attitude, um, ignore behavior that is extreme for the situation, confronting your loved one and telling them, um, you know, you're out of control makes that unwanted emotion last even longer. So don't even, don't even bother. Um, you can try changing the subject. You know, if they're going off about the butter, mm-hmm. you can say, oh, look, we have squeezable peanut butter now. Should we try it? And sometimes that's just what you need to change the track with, that the brain is on and mm-hmm. kind of just cut right through that. Um, when you see that your loved one, I'm, and I'm going to refer to the person who's had a stroke as a loved one, just for simplicity. Um, when you see that your loved one is in a situation where normally you know that they would probably kind of blow their top and they don't, afterwards or really soon afterwards, say to them, I know that that was really difficult for you to kind of hold that together there. And I really appreciate that, that you did that. And, you know, you're doing so much better. And also right. taking rest periods. Rest periods will help them be able to kind of have the physical and emotional strength to continue to deal with, you know, the stresses of life. 
So another behavior that you see with people is denial. They're unaware of physical thinking or judgment problems. They might even deny that they ever had a stroke. Janet, in her interviews and in her books, talks about that. She'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, they gave me all this help, but I, I didn't need that. I didn't have a stroke. Even though she knew she had a stroke. So is that just that the, part the, of your brain forgot it? Oh, OK. All right. So it's not like they're denying yeah. it. They just so, part of your brain forgot it. OK. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the person who's had the stroke might try to re- return to normal activities such as working, driving and socialization too soon. Also be aware of that your loved one may blame you or others when things aren't going well, or they may make up excuses as to, you know, why certain things are happening instead of, you know, being yeah. able to having the insight to say, you know, it's it, the stroke made me do it. Um, it's more of, you know, well, if you didn't leave your shoes there, I wouldn't have fallen anyway or whatever. Fall. How do you like that? I would have fallen anyway. Yeah. Um, So some suggestions to deal with that. Uh, Let your loved one do as much as possible when engaged in activities. The tendency is that we want to over-supervise and over-help. Try to ignore that feeling and supervise only as needed. Don't argue with or confront cooperative behavior. Rather than fight about it, just kind of back off and go play with your um, squirty uh, peanut butter or whatever. Um, And help to guide your loved one through the situation. Remember, denial is not a choice. It's a symptom of the stroke. And a lot of times, if we can learn how to blame the disease, if we can blame the stroke for the, the negative behaviors, it's a lot easier to deal with than to say, Charlie, doggone it anyway, you know, Mm -hmm. and get mad at you rather than at your stroke that you didn't have. Right. And that you can't control. Right. Yeah. So the next aspect of that is irritability and frustration. After a stroke, some people can get easily frustrated, grouchy, and they might want to argue more frequently. They may be less able to control emotions and may overreact in any situation or change. The irritability can last a long time. So what you can do to help is encourage many rest periods. Um, Irritability can increase with tiredness. We all know that, how irritable we can be when we're tired. Mm -hmm. Do not challenge or confront your loved one when they're in a bad mood. You know, like you can see that they're cranky and then, you know, don't be poking the bear. Just, you could even say, oh, I put a towel in the dryer and make it nice and warm for you. Do you want to lay down and I'll cover you with it? As opposed to, God, you're a bear. Go lay down for heaven's sake. (laughs) You know? Yeah. There's lots of ways to take care of these things. Um, Ask your loved one for ideas to solve the problems. You know, like, gosh, you're seeming like you're kind of cranky. What could we do to make you feel better? You know, we have this peanut butter in a tube. Would you, would you like that? Can you tell that I discovered peanut butter in a tube? I, I Peanut butter seems to be a, a theme now. But actually, going back to the first paragraph, I did talk about the, the nuts. So it seemed to be a theme here with the show, nuts. Um, the other thing you want to do is schedule activities. Uh, the rehab team can come up with a schedule, and that might make it a whole lot easier for um, adaptation and make, um, make the loved one less irritable. Remember, irritability is a part of the stroke. It's not directed at anyone. It's just the way it is. Now, the other, another thing you might see with right-sided strokes is what's called social immaturity. Because of the stroke, your loved one may have lost social skills, such as taking turns or making small talk. He or she may be unaware of the needs or the feelings of others. These behaviors may be embarrassing and frustrating for you and your family. So it's almost like there's absolutely no filter, and it feels like everything that comes out of their mouth is extra loud mm-hmm. that you don't want other people to hear. Right. 
So some suggestions, you can tell your loved one privately that their behavior or topic choice is making others uncomfortable. That might be hard if you're sitting at a dinner table and you lean over and say, honey, you know, that discussion about your hemorrhoids really needs to be, you know, we need to change that. And he says, my hemorrhoids? What's wrong with my hemorrhoids? And then you just, you know, feel yourself slinking away or wish you could. Mm -hmm. So you got to kind of choose your battles there. You want to be direct and clear. Do not embarrass or shame your loved one and change the subject. Talk about it later if appropriate. Mention the peanut butter in a tube. Just change the subject. Um, Agitation is, is another symptom. Agitation includes hitting or trying to hit things or people. Outbursts of temper. Um, restlessness, pacing. Um, Your loved one's world is a different place than it used to be. This new world can cause confusion, sometimes fear. Agitation may or may not be caused by or related to current activity or environment. This is usually a temporary stage in the brain's recovery, and the length of the agitated stage is different for each person. So, I think one of the things that's really helpful is to tell yourself as kind of a short-term s- symptom that's a result of the stroke. So some things that might help prevent agitation, avoid overly bright lights, keep volume of the television or radio low but audible, limit visitors to one or two at a time, no more than 20 minutes, follow a rest schedule, Don't allow visitors in the room during rest periods. Avoid noisy, crowded areas. Give simple directions. And stay calm yourself. If your loved one's getting physically agitated, it might be best to leave the room. Be sure your loved one is safe before leaving the room. Sometimes it's best to stay with the person. You've got to know the person that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And... You know, it, these calming activities, you think, well, I don't want to treat them like a baby. Well, the brain is recovering. The brain has had what we call like a major insult. And so it's got to be able to rest. And you can't rest if the TV is screaming at you and, you know, you've got a couple kids sitting around there playing those video games that are so loud. And, you know, just kind of some good common sense and understanding which side of the brain is affected and what kind of behaviors you can consider to see. Now, uh, right brain survivors sometimes have a uh, condition called unilateral inattention or left neglect. So remember, the right-sided stroke is going to affect the left side of the body. Um, Simply put, it's as though you don't realize that the left side of your body exists. So you can be walking and literally the whole left side of your body walks into a doorway. And because as far as your brain is concerned, that's kind of not really there. So you need to remind your loved one to pay attention to hygiene skills, you know, shaving, combing hair and all of that on the left side of the body. It's very fascinating to watch people. You know, like for a man, tell them to go in and shave, and they shave the right side of their face, and their left side's not fi- not shaved. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, be be aware of that, um, and say, oh, you know that uh, that right side of your hair looks great. Now, how about that left side? Um, in terms of clothes, you want to make sure that uh, the clothes you buy are easy to put on. Um, if they're willing to wear elastic waistbands, that kind of thing is easier to put on. I'm putting clothes on and maybe sewing like just a little red ribbon or something on the um, right side of their clothing so that they know which side their arm is going to go into. It's the one with the little ribbon, that kind of thing. Um, person with a right side brain stroke um, often speaks clearly. The language part's not a problem. But there can be changes with memory, judgment, reasoning, and the ability to plan. So what do you do? You want to make sure you speak clearly and slowly, simple sentences. Don't shout. 
I don't know if you've traveled to other countries, um, Charlie, where people, instead of like learning the language, they just speak English really loud because that's going to help people understand. Are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, some people do the same thing with someone who's had a stroke. It's not going to make a difference. Um, give gentle reminders to stay on pocket on topic. Uh, make sure the person can see you. And really, really important, I think, is to remember that you got to still treat that person as an adult. Sometimes, you know, especially if it's like um, wives with their husbands, you know, they'll start to sort of treat them like babies that can't do things. And then once that treatment starts, then emotionally they start and, you know, how they talk to that person becomes very infantilizing. And you don't want to let yourself fall into that because that is still your husband. That is still your wife. That is still your parent. And you need to be talking to them as an adult. Any questions about that, Charles? No, it's a lot to think to, to think about. It's just just the little details and nuances that I just never I just never thought about. You know, people see images and you know in movies and TVs, the occasional documentary, but uh, well, it's a lot. Well, that's why I'm here, Charles. Yes. To blow your mind. So, so we, th- we thought that in our third half, um, we would do just a quick scene from our funeral theater where we put the fun in funeral. And uh, Charlie, do you want to set up the scene for us? Sure. Or at least I don't know that he could really set up the scene because it's a documentary. But tell us about this documentary. Well, it's called My Beautiful Broken Brain. Uh, it is about 34-year-old Lacha Soderlund's personal voyage into the complexity, fragility, and wonder of her own brain following a life-changing hemorrhagic stroke. So, regaining consciousness to an alien world, Lada was thrown into a new existence of distorted reality, where words held no meaning and where her sensory perception had changed beyond recognition. It's a documentary about hope, transformation, and the limitless power of the human mind. And you can see that on Prime Video. So this scene that we're going to be doing, um, Lacha is in a stroke rehab facility. And... um, you know, she's young, she's 34, and she didn't have, you know, like your regular stroke, you know, that you see in kind of older people where there mm-hmm. was a blockage and one part of her brain was affected. What she had was probably a congenital, meaning she was born with it weakening in one part of her veins or arteries in her brain wow. so that one day they kind of just went loose. And... um So her issues, if we'll call them that, with having had the stroke are more global, meaning it's not just the left, it's not just the right, it's kind of bigger than that. And so she had and has a kind of bigger issue um, as a result of the stroke and the changes she needs to go to plus her very, very young age. So, um, in this scene, she's talking about just the life in the rehab center where she's living. And I'm going to be Lacha, and Charlie is going to be Adam, who is another patient at that facility. Okay. Here I am in the brain room. This is where I perform my leisure activities. And this is where I like to play snooker or write some music. You have to come here sometimes. It's a real hoot. Hey, Adam. Hello. How you doing? Wonderful. 
What are you making? I'm not making. I'm creating. <laughs> What are you creating? A robot for my son. You're my only friend here, Adam. I'm your only friend? Here at the RNRU, yeah. Well, you've got a good friend. That's all I can say. You're not wrong there, Adam. Very good friend. Are you looking forward to going home? Going into the real world? I'm. I'm looking forward to it, yes. But I'll deal with it when I get there because I've been out here for a long time. You think it's going to be all right? Yeah. Life is what you make it. Life is what you make it. So we, uh, we chose that scene not because it's necessarily poignant, but you can see how small the world can become after a stroke. You know, if you think about all the things you do all day long, all the different movements and people you talk to and the stuff that you do, And then um, you kind of look at this scene and you say, it, you know, it comes down to a few people. And as she talks about, you know, her brain room where she's able to do her leisure activities, it's very different than the life she had before her stroke. I guess I've seen too many uh, movies and TV shows where there's an image of, uh, of how someone with a stroke behaves. And, and what, it's, it's what usually is that something, image? well, it, it, I call it a Hollywood image where, you know, speech, is, speech might be slurred. Um, physically, there looks like there's something very much wrong with someone's body or part of someone's body. Like a, like a one size fits all, uh, rather than mm. you know, stroke. A stroke affects people in different ways. It, it depends, like you said, left side, right side, the severity of it, the depth of uh, of the stroke. So that how long it's been? How long it's how been long since it's been, the stroke? Yeah. Because yeah. if it's a new one, the the symptoms will be far more severe. Yeah, and so. Even even if our listeners aren't in a situation where they know anybody with a stroke, but perhaps when they see people who've had a stroke, they can kind of run it through their heads that, you know, it isn't one size fits all. There's a lot of different components and aspects to it and to kind of figure out what that is. And in fact, um, Janet Douglas in, in her book, and. When she talks about the stroke, she used to work as a, she was, I think she was an occupational therapist. And she talks very openly, like in chapter one, where she says, I didn't like working with people with strokes. I hated it. And, you know, here she is at, with an, a large stroke that, you know, she has to come back with, come back from. So... It's it's not for the faint of hearted, and no. the caregivers, people with strokes, is not for the faint of hearted too. It's 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 a long road, so as much support and kindness we can send out into the universe to you, we do. And with that, thank you for listening. Please stay tuned for future episodes of Everyone Dies. Our thanks to our executive producer. Major General Retired, David Gillette, our producer, Sandy, John, our technical advisor, Tom Hartman, our administrative advisor, Molly, our Twitter correspondent, and our friends, family, and our loyal listeners who are supporting our work at Everyone Dies. This is Charlie Navarrete. And I'm Marianne Matzo. 
We look forward to talking with you soon. Remember, every day is a gift. This podcast does not provide medical advice. All discussion on this podcast, such as treatments, dosages, outcomes, charts, patient profiles, advice, messages, and any other discussion are for informational purposes only and are not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Always seek the advice of your primary care practitioner or other qualified health providers with any questions that you may have regarding your health. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard from this podcast. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your doctor or 911 immediately. Everyone Dies does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, practitioners, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned in this podcast. Reliance on any information provided in this podcast by persons appearing on this podcast at the invitation of Everyone Dies or by other members is solely at your own risk.